Hi, everybody. I want to introduce you to a tax attorney. And, you know, many times in real estate, we have tax questions uh, to our buyers and to our sellers. And uh, I found somebody that uh, is really is his CPA firm actually specializes in in real estate, which is great. And uh, he started his firm is now virtual. He actually started a virtual firm with 40 employees in 2015. He, in other words, he started virtual before virtual was cool. So uh, he's in, uh, so you're in 40, how many states are you in? I, th I think every state at this point. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So that begs me to uh, ask you the first question, which is not on the list, but what's the best place to retire to tax-wise? <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely, you, you definitely want to look at an income free, an, an income tax free state. Yes. Um, so, I mean, a lot of our clients look at Florida. Mm -hmm. That's an obvious one. Um, but Washington's good. Texas is good. The problem with those states is the property taxes. So mm -hmm. where, where you win on not paying income tax, you lose on mm -hmm. paying property tax. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's something people ask us all the time. And a lot of people move from Florida here. We call them halfbacks when they move back to North Carolina, by the way. <laughs> I haven't way. heard that term. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to start you out with a question that one of my agents just asked me today. You know, we're still in a low inventory market and sometimes, um, well, not sometimes, but pretty much all the time, if a buyer is making an offer but he's making it contingent on the sale of his house, it's not even taken seriously. Uh, so to make a non-contingent offers, many of our buyers are actually borrowing from their 401k. Hmm. So tell me about the, you know, the, the problems with that and the pluses with that. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the plus is that it's, it's your money that you're able to gain access to. Mm -hmm. um, you can, I believe most 401k plans allow you to leave the value or, or whatever you're collateralizing with the loan inside of your 401k, it, you can leave it in equity so you can continue to invest even though you're taking the money out as a loan. Well, um, Actually, that's not true. No, I'm thinking about something else. I'm thinking about a marginal. 401k loan, yeah, you would be liquidating, essentially liquidating the 401k, but you do have to pay it back. That's the key. And, and the big danger with the 401k loans is that if you were to leave your job or get fired, mm -hmm. then you have a certain amount of time to pay that loan back and that could put mm -hmm. you in a really tough position. Um, a lot of times, our client we advise our clients not to take loans from their four hundred one ks. There's there's really? typically different types of financing available. Okay. Um, I mean, I'd be looking at like a HELOC or something uh, other than a four hundred one k loan. Because of the penalties, is that because if you don't pay yeah. it back within a certain period of time, you get a big penalty? Yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. just it's just a. I I just view it as a high risk loan. It's just. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of gotchas. Like, like I said, mm. the, the biggest problem with it is if you were to get fired or if you were to leave your job, you have to pay the loan back within a certain amount of time, and that can put people in a tough position. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if they, they feel confident that they're going to keep their job, and uh, is, there, is every 401 different, or is there just a general thing, I've got to pay it back within six months, it's going to cost me X amount of interest? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much the way that it works. Mm -hmm. There are some 401k plans that won't allow you to get loans. Oh. Um, so you do have to, you know, you, you have to consult your employer plan. Okay. Um, but all the details will be in the employer plan, and, and you'll be able to kind of understand what it looks like. But yeah, I mean, if, if that's your, if that's how you're going to access capital, then... You know, go for it, but run run it by your your team of advisors. Uh, I mean, I'd be working with a financial advisor on it too to make sure that it makes sense. Because okay. when you're when you're pulling the money out of the four hundred one k, you're you're losing that. Um, I don't know, just that that continued equity exposure, and that might not be a good thing uh, mm -hmm. for your financial plan. So you you have to make sure that you run it by your financial advisor. Wow. Okay. Well, there's a lot of people you need to have on your team then. Not yeah, only a yeah, CPA, but yeah. a financial advisor. Maybe we'll talk to one of those next. <laughs> but um, I just the, the easiest question I've got for you is just what's the most common mistake homeowners make on tax write-offs? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, th there's a lot of mistakes. So the first is... Uh, I guess just in general, mm -hmm. thinking that a lot of personal expenses are deductible. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not in business, if you're not investing in rental real estate, then you know you can't just go set up a home office. You can't set up an LLC and just start deducting things. 
Um, we, we see that sometimes with, with I guess, mm-hmm. the standard homeowner. Uh, but in terms of like tax write-offs in general, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that there's a whole lot of crazy mistakes. I think that people just make tax moves without realizing that they're making tax moves. You know, they might mm-hmm. cash out their IRA and not realize... Uh, you not only get to pay tax, but you also have to pay a 10% penalty. Um, mm. They might take that 401k loan without talking to anybody. And right. they, they might just look at the the capital inside of the, the retirement account and say, well, that's mine and I should be able to access it, which is totally true. But you just, I think the biggest mistake is just not understanding tax consequences mm-hmm. and not running it by anybody before they pull the trigger on different mm-hmm. things. So I think that's true. Yep. So, um, just a general discussion. I know you, you help a lot of your clients with rentals, um, and now we, there's so many people that I know that are buying uh, short-term rentals, be Airbnb. Yeah. What's the difference between that and a regular rental? Is there any tax differences? Yeah, so so rental real estate is where I have my tax expertise, and, and it's my firm's tax expertise as well. Every single one of our clients invests in rental real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, across the country, and we've got about 700 clients across the country. Wow! Um, yeah, it, it's been it's been a lot of fun, and it's really cool talking to all these real estate investors and watching them grow their portfolios and make different tax moves. So there are differences between long term rentals and short term rentals. Uh, there's obvious differences in just management. Um, there's you know other obvious differences just in terms of wear and tear and all of that, but the tax differences. Are very nuanced and it's very complex. So a typical rental, a long-term rental, is one where I'll have like a, a 12-month lease, mm-hmm. and you know I've got my rents coming in, I've got all my operating expenses, my insurance, my property taxes, my repairs, maintenance, management fees, all of that, and then I'm going to have my net sort of operating income, and then I've got my depreciation, and depreciation is a phantom expense. Mm-hmm. It's meant to track deterioration of your asset over time. Mm-hmm. So it's true that our rentals appreciate in value, but it's also true that the roof literally falls apart. The right. windows fall apart. The carpet falls apart, right? right? The things inside of that rental fall apart. That's what depreciation is meant to track. It's that falling apart of your building. Mm-hmm. So when you buy a property, um, let's say I buy a property for a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I have to find the value of land. Uh, so, and there's different ways that you can do that. You typically go to the county assessor website, and you're able to find this ratio of land to the purchase price. Right. So I find the value of land because land cannot be depreciated. Land does not fall apart over time. Mm-hmm. Right. It just stays the same. Once I find the value of land, I subtract that from my purchase price. So I buy a property for hundred k. My land's ten. That means my building value is ninety thousand right. dollars. That's what I'm depreciating, mm-hmm. and I just take that ninety thousand. I divide it by twenty-seven and a half years. I don't know why it's twenty-seven and a half years. That's just what Congress came up with. <laughs> so twenty-seven and a half years, and whatever that number is, that's my annual depreciation that I get to wow. claim. So that's an annual expense I get to claim every single year. And and the reason I'm explaining depreciation is because that's the power of investing in rental real estate. It's all about that depreciation. Because if my rental income is $20,000 and my operating expenses are $16,000, my net profit's $4,000. But if my depreciation on that rental is $6,000, then I actually have a tax loss of 2K, right? Mm -hmm. My profit of 4K Mm -hmm. netted out against that depreciation expense of 6K. So my net tax loss is 2K. But I actually made money. That's the thing, right? So four thousand dollars hit my pocket. Right. But I'm telling the IRS I lost two thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So that's the that's the beauty of investing in real estate. Because if I can do that ten times, now I'm netting. I'm I'm having actual cash flow hit my pocket. I'm ha- of forty thousand dollars. But I'm telling the IRS I lost twenty thousand mm. dollars. If I can do it ten more times, now it's four hundred, two hundred thousand, right? <laughs> so it's really it's it's the ability. Depreciation gives us the ability to effectively defer paying tax on the profit that we're receiving from our long-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Now, short-term rentals operate the same way. The difference is that tax loss of $2,000. So after I factor in my depreciation expense Mm -hmm. and I get this tax loss, what do I do with the tax loss? That's always the big question. Can I use the $2,000 against my other income? Right. And with long-term rentals, the answer is typically no. No, you cannot. You have to suspend the tax loss and carry it forward. 
There's exceptions to the rules, which we're not going to, well, we can if you've got another three hours, no, we can no, go no, into no. it. <laughs> so there's, there's exceptions to the rules that allow you to use the $2,000 loss, right. but um, not many people can qualify for all that. So, so this $2,000 tax loss just hangs out on your tax return forever. It just, it just becomes suspended and you can't use it. The short-term rental situation is a little bit different. That $2,000 tax loss on a short-term rental I could probably use that $2,000 tax loss. Again, you have to make sure you qualify for exceptions. There's a concept called material participation. So I have to make sure that I materially participate in the rental activity. But, um, but if I do, short, short-term rentals, it's easier to use that tax loss. Yeah. So a lot of our clients will buy short-term rentals mm-hmm. to generate those tax losses to use them against their income. Mm-hmm. Because there's this cool concept called cost segregation studies. Mm-hmm. Cost segregation studies effectively create larger amounts of annual depreciation during the first five years of ownership. Uh, actually, first 15, but typically first five years of ownership. Mm-hmm. So this $2,000 tax loss in the first year of ownership could actually be like a $40,000 tax loss, right? Oh, and so if I can use that $40,000 tax loss to offset my income, now I'm going to save $12,000 in taxes, Right. And so if I'm buying two or three of these types of properties, maybe I've got $100,000 in tax losses thanks to just being a short-term rental, being able to qualify for one of these exceptions, or or being able to materially participate, uh, being able to uh, cost segregate the property. I can create these like $100,000 of tax losses that can be used to offset my income. Um, if I structure everything appropriately and that that's valuable, it creates mm-hmm. a large tax refund. So that's where we do a lot of our planning. We do a ton of education about it as well. It's very nuanced. It's very technical. Um, if there's any uh, like tax attorneys or CPAs listening to this, you're welcome to come check our stuff out. We go really in depth with it. Uh, but that's the high level. It's you it's know, a depreciation. That's plan. so interesting. But I just want to tell the, the agents that are watching right now, this is the reason we don't give tax advice. And I've heard agents give you know, minimal tax advice and just sound like they really know what they're talking about, but yeah. uh, they really don't. It's like trying to diagnose somebody and you're not a doctor. Yeah, uh, yeah So this absolutely. is this is a reason you go to a professional, and I think uh, that's good advice. I hope everybody will do that. Um, how can I explain somebody's current tax value that just doesn't understand? Like, for example, this morning I looked at a property. Uh, the tax value on it was, I think, 843 Zillow had it at... Uh, 1.3, Redfin had it at 1.4. Tell me about Wake County. How do I explain their tax value to them? Uh, well, I mean, honestly, that's not really my area of expertise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that, you know, Wake County, uh, well, most governments across the United States, um, whenever you acquire a property, they're going to send, they're going to reassess it at that mm-hmm. new acquisition price, and that'll be your new property tax value. So so when you purchase it, they're going to give you a new tax value. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and if you do any sort of like major improvements, they'll come out and assess those too. Mm-hmm. So they'll increase your tax value as a result. Um, yeah. But from like an income tax perspective, the property tax value doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Let's talk about capital gains and the best way to avoid taxes. I've been asked this a <laughs> lot of times. Uh, the best way to avoid a big tax hit, there's been a lot of people that have gained value on their homes that it's just been incredible. Yeah. Um, just walk us through anything you can help with that. So there are two, sorry, there are two main strategies. The mm-hmm. first is something called the Section 121 exclusion. Mm-hmm. A lot of people know that as the 250000 or $500,000 exclusion. If you live in your property for two of the past five years, Mm -hmm. you qualify for a section 121 exclusion. So if I'm married, if I'm not married, it's 250K. If I'm married, it's 500K. So if my wife and I bought a property back in, I don't know, 2019, Mm -hmm. uh, and we're still living in it, then we will have hit this two year mark. So now we could sell our property. And as long as the total capital gain doesn't exceed $500,000, we don't have to report it. We don't have to pay tax on it. Wow. Uh, now, if the capital gain is $600,000, then I have to pay tax on six hundred dollars minus five hundred, dollars So I have to pay tax on $100,000. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you really want to get strategic, which I highly recommend that you, you, uh, you do, um, you could also rent the property out. 
Mm -hmm. after you leave because because the section 121 exclusion is two of the last five years mm -hmm. so you live in it for two years or three years or ten years mm -hmm. it doesn't matter but over the over a five-year look back you lived in it for two years that's how you qualify for the section 121 exclusion right but what you can also do is rent the property out and then 1031 exchange mm -hmm. any excess gain that you're not able to eliminate from the section 121 exclusion so here's how this works Let's say I bought a property for $700,000 in 2018. Okay. And let's say today it's worth $1.3 million. So it's a $600,000 total gain. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say that I decide I'm going to move out of it because I want to go buy another property or whatever. I want to, for whatever reason. So I move out, change my primary residence. Now, I lived in the property for the past four years, so I'm good. I move out today. I rent it. As long as I sell it within the next three years... I'm still going to qualify for that section 121 exclusion. Why the next three years? Because again, it's the last two out of five years. Right. So we've got a five year look back, a three year excess. So what I can do is I can move out today. I can rent it, right. make it an investment property. And now because it's an investment property, I qualify for section 1031. So I can 1031 exchange the property whenever I finally sell it three years from now. Mm -hmm. And if I still have that $600,000 gain, I eliminate $500,000 of it thanks to the Section 121 exclusion, mm -hmm. and the remaining $100,000, I can 1031 exchange it and not pay tax on it today. So I can go and roll it into another investment property. Okay. So I can I can tag team. Uh, if th The key is you have to make it a rental property. You mm -hmm. have to make it an investment property. I see. As long as I do that, any excess gain after I sell my old primary residence, I can 1031 it and not pay tax on it today. And I can continue building a real estate portfolio. And then I can cost segregate it. I can oh do my, everything oh else goodness, that I was just oh talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 1031, I, I've certainly heard about that before. Yeah. When you explain that, it's hard to explain it in layman's terms. But basically, how would you tell somebody that's just not familiar with that at all? If you are in total layman's terms, it's Monopoly. You remember playing Monopoly? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You buy it, you get like the three greenhouses and then <laughs> right. you exchange it for a hotel. I see. That's I what see. a 1031 is. Oh, so so cool. you buy a lot of little houses, then you exchange them for the next larger house. Mm. Right? Yeah. I was good at Monopoly. Yeah. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we'll try that. So tell me about capital gains rules on primary residence versus investment properties and inherited properties. So primary residences, we just kind of talked about mm -hmm. with the Section 121 exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and just to reiterate, I can exclude up to $500,000 of capital gain when I sell my property, as long as I've lived in it for two of the past five years. Right. Investment properties, the still same capital gain. Uh, you also have something called depreciation recapture, so that all that depreciation benefit that I was talking about a few minutes ago, you do have to pay tax on all the depreciation you've taken whenever you sell the property. I see. So it basically increases your gain. Sometimes people, people will say, well, then I just won't take depreciation. But the problem is the IRS is going to assume that you did anyway, and they're gonna tax you as if you did anyway. So you might as well take the depreciation. But mm -hmm. when you sell an investment property, you've got capital gain and depreciation recapture, and you can 1031 exchange all of that. So a lot of our clients, when they sell property, they're just going through 1031 exchanges. They're just trading up to the hotel, right? Okay. Um, and they just keep going and going. And there's a there's a uh, a strategy called swap until you drop. You know, because you just keep <laughs> like you keep exchanging, keep exchanging, keep exchanging. Then we get a little morbid. You die. You pass it on to your heirs. <laughs> but your heirs, whenever they inherit the property, since you asked about inherited property, they get a stepped up basis in the property. Uh -huh. And a stepped up basis essentially means you take whatever the fair market value is today, so you get it appraised. That's the basis that they inherited it at. So you bought the property for $100,000, you, you then did four 1031 exchanges, now it's worth a million dollars. If you sold it, you'd have like some crazy capital gain, but you don't, you just, you pass away, you give it to your heirs, your heirs inherit the property at a million dollars. Okay. So they can immediately sell it for a million dollars, pay zero tax. Mm -hmm. Or they can start the depreciation game all over again, mm -hmm. um, and they can make it their own investment property. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cool things that you can do. Huge mistake that we've seen. Mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I like I, I have a son uh, and I also have a bunch of rental properties. So a huge mistake that I that I'm not going to make, but that we see is I go, I think, oh, man, I want my son to have some skin in the game. I want him to learn how to manage a rental right, property. Right. I want I want to pay for his college. Um, I want to I want to make probate easy, whatever, whatever the reason. 
So I'm going to add them to title, right? So mm -hmm. I put them on the title. I basically give them 50% of the property. Maybe I give them the entire property. Uh, what happens there is that when I die, my son does not get a stepped up basis because I already gave him the property, Ooh, right? So I it see. can crush people, mm -hmm. absolutely crush people. You have to be really careful with that type of planning. Mm -hmm. um, we generally are trying to figure out trust structures or something Something that's not just let's just throw them on title because now we're just gifting them the property and they inherit my my basis when I mm -hmm. gift them the property. Mm -hmm. um, and it will totally just crush people with taxes mm -hmm. whenever that unfortunate day comes. <laughs> you know, I know. You know, it's interesting because I've worked with many young couples who had their first child and uh, they bought a house. And that house was for the purpose of renting out until that child was ready to go to college. Yep. And they would sell that house and then... That's a good plan. They bought it for the first, second, and then third child. So yeah. that was a yeah. that's a small time investor. Uh, I'm sure you work with investors that have okay. hundreds and hundreds of homes. I don't know how small of an investor you take on. Well, we we take on investors that only have one property, okay. so we go all the way down. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. So tell me, is there any benefits of setting up an A corp? Uh, not that I'm aware of. And um. Hmm. Okay, well, you hear all these terms about, you know, how you should be, how you should be uh, taking your taxes, whether it's A Corp or S Corp or any of that. S Corp, yeah, sure. For mm -hmm. Especially for real estate agents, an S Corporation can be really good. Um, there's, you know, when you are a real estate agent, the commissions that you receive are subject to self-employment taxes. Mm -hmm. So an S corporation allows you to avoid some exposure to those self-employment taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what you have to figure out is just, you know, you, the, the major mistake with S corporations is not paying yourself a reasonable salary. So if I net $200,000 from commissions, if I don't have an S corporation, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pay a 15.3%, whatever the phase out is, but 15.3% tax on 200K. And then I'm going to pay my marginal taxes. So that 15.3%, that's the self-employment tax. So what people will do is they'll set up an S corporation and they'll route their commissions through an S corporation. And this, this doesn't work in every state. Um, but the whole purpose there is to say, of my $200,000 commission, I'm going to pay myself a salary of $100,000. Mm -hmm. So only the salary portion, when you're running an S corporation, is subject to that 15.3% self-employment tax. The remainder is not. So you kind of skirt the self-employment tax rules. But the key is, is you have to make sure that you pay yourself a reasonable salary. So, uh, and, and this is, an, is now an IRS audit target as mm -hmm. within the last six months or so. Well, the so whole they, self uh, uh -huh. S corp, if yes, you've got so they, that, that's a red flag for them. Not necessarily mm -hmm. a red flag, but when you are not paying yourself a reasonable salary, it is now an audit target as of this year. Mm -hmm. So an issue would be my, I'm going to put my $200,000 of commissions into this S corp and my salary is going to be $0. Mm -hmm. That will be an audit target and you will lose. You're not going to win that. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be able to come up with a reasonable salary and you have to be able to substantiate that reasonable salary under audit. Uh, and we help, we help, we actually help many real estate agents do exactly that. Mm -hmm. We help brokers do exactly that. Um, but it's not, it's not going to be as good of a uh, strategy as might be promoted by mm -hmm. folks once mm -hmm. it's all said and done. Because if you're like mm -hmm. the solo person generating all the income, it's going to be very difficult to substantiate some low salary uh, because the IRS is going to take the position that, well, you're the one that earned all of this. So the salary should be the full amount of your commissions. And so <laughs> that's where they're going to start. Um, and so you can walk them back a little bit, but you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to, to, you know, totally eliminate it. And I think with it being an audit target, um, you just got to be really careful. Well, I've been audited once, and it's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> so, uh, we, we, we've assisted with, with several audits, and uh, as long as you're prepared, it's, it's fine. Good. Yeah, but it's the ones that are messy and painful are, are when people are not prepared. And, and like, the reality is, is taxes are extremely complex, right? Yes, I know. You get yeah. that big book, and they put one yeah. out every year. <laughs> And it's really thick and you have yep. to know all those new rules. Yeah, taxes are extremely complex and even the best advisors, you know, you, the, the key is to work with really good advisors that will educate you on what you need to be doing mm -hmm. 
um, to substantiate any sort of audit. I mean, that's the name of the game. It's, well, we can take all these awesome tax positions, but if you can't substantiate it under audit, then what's the point? So it's yeah. about documentation and getting things in order. Um, and as long as you do that, it, it's it's not a horrible experience. It's, it's not fun, <laughs> but it's not horrible either. <laughs> Are there any tax deductions that, uh, we're talking about agents, so is there any tax deductions that agents are just, they don't, they don't take. They just don't know about them, so they're not taking those tax deductions. I mean, look, you, you. I'm sure that you've, if you've gone to any sort of tax webinar or anything like mm -hmm. that, you've probably learned about S corporations. You've probably learned about solo 401ks. You've probably learned about, uh, you know, writing off your vehicles with Section 179, all, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And all of that is is good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, where I think agents are completely missing out. Uh, and, and I only say this because we work with a lot of agents, um, is agents are not investing in rental real estate as much as they should be. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, is that agents, that whole depreciation thing that I explained earlier, mm -hmm. the whole cost segregation study thing that I explained, mm -hmm. if you invest some time into learning how that works, and we have a lot of educational content on our website, which I can share here at the end. Um, if you invest time in learning how all of that works, Agents can legitimately pay, but you always have to pay your self-employment tax, but your income tax, you could legitimately pay, pay zero dollars. Wow. Um, and, 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 you, and it could be 100% defensible because agents have this upper hand. The, the whole, the whole that, that $2,000 loss from that example I use mm -hmm. where it gets suspended and carried right. forward, right. well, agents can potentially or are more likely to qualify, qualify for an exception to the rules, which means they don't have to suspend that $2,000 tax loss. Mm -hmm. So if they have the $2,000 tax loss, they can use that loss to offset their agent income. But again, when you do a cost segregation study, that tax loss could turn into a $100,000 tax loss that you, could, that you could use to offset your agent income. Mm -hmm. So real estate agents have this, uh, this kind of competitive advantage in, in the tax world that they don't know about wow. um, a lot of times. But what you have to do is you have to buy rental real estate. So you have to buy, but you don't have to buy short-term rentals because you don't mm -hmm. have to, short-term rentals, people buy short-term rentals to qualify for like the, the special workaround because they're not involved in a real estate business full-time. But real mm -hmm. estate agents are already involved in that real estate business full-time or a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so they, 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 they potentially already qualify for this special exception for the long-term rentals. So you could buy three long-term rentals a year. Right. You could cost segregate those three long-term rentals and you could legitimately be writing off 100,000 or so uh, against your income. And, yeah. and, and that just creates tax savings that allows you to go buy the next rental and mm -hmm. do it again. That's a really good advice for anyone in this business. I think we do have a special advantage and it's a shame not to take care of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna keep you any longer because I just wanna get the message across that taxes are very complicated. Each person that you spend time with buying or selling real estate has got a different situation. So one size doesn't fit all, and you need to get a tax professional to guide you mm -hmm. along those lines. And and uh, and I tell you what, I'm talking to a great one today. I'm guessing that his math teacher loved him very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> well, that was great. Thank you. This is Brandon Hall, CPA. He's from Hall CPA. And he's uh, in 40, uh, he has 40 virtual assistants, employees that are all the way across the United States. So he can help with tax situations in any state in the United States of America. And I'd love for you to call him because he's been very kind to us to meet with us today and tell us a few things. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate you. your time.